طيب السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين So everyone has access to this, right? Uh, so as, as it was advertised, we'll be talking inshallah about uh, murabaha as a mode of financing. And inshallah next week, bi-ithnillahi ta'ala, we'll be talking about July 1st, we'll be talking about musharaka or diminishing musharaka as a, as a mode of financing, especially within the housing market. Uh, the other week, which is July 8th, we are not sure if we're going to do the halaqa or not, because there is a possibility that July 8th could be the day of Arafah. And it's a great opportunity for dua and for ibadah and for fasting. So I'm not sure we're going to keep the halaqa or cancel it on July 8th. Um, after that, uh, we'll come back with another program, inshallah, on July 15th, ta'ala. And then another sheikh will come, another imam will take over and do another series, inshallah. So today, as I said, we'll be talking about murabaha. And this is here, this is a basic definition of murabaha. So basically here, it's a financial agreement. And it happens, well, uh, this agreement is made when a financial institution purchases the asset from a vendor or request from the client. Someone needs something, he needs a house, he needs a car, an equipment. He comes to the financial institution. I call it FI here, I'll keep saying FI, is saying, instead of saying financial institution, the FI. The FI will, will buy the, the commodity or the property or the car and then they resell it to the client, usually on a deferred payment. It might happen on, on cash. It used to happen in the past, during the early days of Islam. People used to do it for different reasons. Some of them, methane, they don't have experience in the market. They would come to someone else who is more experienced, and they would tell him, uh, I want you to buy something for, to, to, for me from the market, and then you sell it to me with a profit. But nowadays, it is used as a mode of financing. So usually it is done with this, with, with a payment plan, with deferred payment plan, and with mutually, it's supposed to be mutually agreed profit added to the cost of the asset. So basically, this is, this is a very basic definition of al-murabaha. Murabaha is a sale, it's not a loan. This is something that we need to keep in mind. Allah has permitted trade and he forbidden or he forbidden usury riba and it is based on the cost plus concept yeah, and if you know the the initial cost the initial price as I said you ask a financial the FI to buy it for you you know the initial price and you know how much they are making and the amount of the profit made by the seller if they don't make any reference to the cost of the, of the product and the profit, then it is called musawama. Musawama basically it means negotiation. And it is preferred by Muslim scholars. Murabaha is not haram, but they prefer musawama because musawama, they don't, the seller doesn't have the obligation to disclose the initial cost. No, he doesn't have to tell him how much I bought it. Right? And how much profit I'm making. I'm selling this for 5,000. I'm selling this for 10,000. You like it, you don't like it. This is the price, right? But here we don't need it. I mean, it's not needed here. Our topic is about murabaha. And it is used nowadays, as I said, in modern uh, Islamic finance. And it is used by Islamic banks, financial institutions, as a mode of financing, especially in the Muslim world. Uh, some Muslim scholars, they said 80% of the transactions made by Islamic banks and Islamic institutions in the Muslim world, uh, 80% are based on murabah. This is a statement that was made by many scholars. And as I said, here there is, we have a problem here. Many Muslims are not able to distinguish between murabah based on a deferred payment a plan, right, with a financing plan, 
And of course, there is, when there is financing, there is an increase in the price. They're not able to distinguish between this transaction and between riba. You know, you know what I mean here? They tell you, what's the difference? It's the same thing. The Islamic bank will buy the car or the house for 10,000 and they will sell it to me for 15,000. And I go to the bank and I take a loan of 10,000 and I pay them 15,000 back. 5,000 here is called interest. 5,000 here is called profit or interest. Uh, sorry, it's called ribh. Ribh, that's why, you know, that's the origin of the word murabah. Ribh means profit. But they are not able to see the difference, and there is a big difference. Murabaha is a sale. And people are allowed to sell with any terms they want, with any conditions they want, as long as they are Sharia. These conditions are Sharia compliant. And this is a sale that is permissible, as long as the conditions are good and they are Sharia compliant. And Murabaha, there is nothing wrong with Murabaha if it is done in the right way. But still, there are some Muslims who are confused about it. This is the answer. The answer is in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah has permitted trade and forbidden usury. So when you give a loan to someone, a loan in Islam has to be a qard hasan. has to be a goodly loan. You cannot charge any profit on the loan. You don't make money on money in Islam. But, uh, but when you are trading, you're doing business, you're buying and selling, then you have the freedom to buy and sell in any way you want, as long as there is no riba, there is no gharar, uncertainty, and there is no injustice, zulm. These are the main three issues that are found in, within the financial, any financial system nowadays. Whether we're talking about conventional finance, or, co or talking about Islamic finance, we have to avoid these three main issues, riba, gharar, uncertainty, and zulm, zulm, injustice. Because Islam wants us to do, to do business with full transparency and full justice. This is the objective. These are the objectives of Sharia when it comes to, to business. So I'm allowed to say, I'll, uh, I can sell you this for, for 2,000, for example, cash. But if you, uh, if you want to pay it within one year or two years, I'll sell it for 3,000. This is halal. As long as you're dealing with the seller, there's no third party. There is a big issue within, uh, you know, uh, the, you, 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 with dealers. When you go and buy a car, this is a big issue nowadays. There are many Muslims, they go to the dealers and they tell them, okay, we're not allowed to deal with riba. And they tell them, okay, we'll just add the interest to the cost, and you pay it up front. <laughs> and they think that's halal, and they're happy. These Muslim brothers are happy. They don't know that there is a third party, or they don't know sometimes, they know sometimes, Allahu Alam, third party, which is usually the bank financing the deal. And the bank is taking this interest. So whether you pay it on a monthly basis, or you pay it up front, it's the same. You're paying interest. So you need to, you need to know how things work, yeah, Juan. If this increase is made by the seller himself, which is not the, ca the case with car dealers, we're not talking about now housing, talking about car dealers, right, car dealership. If the seller himself, it doesn't happen, but if the seller himself increases the price and he gives you financing, then this is halal. مؤجل, this is halal. But if there is a third party financing the deal, Paying on your behalf, this third party will take the interest. Whether you pay it up front or you pay it on a monthly basis, it doesn't make a difference. So we need to understand, education here is very important, Ya Khwan. And by the way, the purpose of this program is educational. Yani I want you guys, I want you to understand how Murabaha works. Uh, I'm not going to discuss people. I'm not going to discuss companies. I'm not going to give you names of companies. But we're going to talk about the red flags and warnings and issues that are found in the market. And I want you to pay attention to these issues so when you deal with any company, 
Do you know what you're doing? Uh, so this is very important, ya Ikhwan, because then the m most of the brothers and sisters who come to the masajid, they ask this question, is this company halal, this agreement halal? And they want a yes or no answer. And I don't like this. We are educated people. We went to university. We have degrees. At least we try to understand the basic, some basics of our Islamic you know, finance. We have our own system. We have our own financial system. Like we learn how to make wudu and how to, and how to pray and how to fast and how to give zakat. We need to spend some time learning about this field because we need it. It's part of our life. We need to buy cars. We need to buy homes. We need to do business. It's part of the life of any human being. And we, we have another obligation. We need to do business in a halal way. As Muslims, we need to do business in a halal way. Now, we need to talk about fundamental rules of sale. Not all of them are here, but the most important basic rules of sale are here. The subject of sale must exist at the time of sale. There are some exceptions for this. It's called salam and istisna. It's not our subject. We, we don't have time to talk about them today. But the basic rule is that the subject of sale must exist at the time of sale. For example, Muhammad sells the fruit of his garden to Ali before they appear. This is not valid. Or before they grow, before they become like red or yellow. If they become yellow, he's allowed to, to sell. They don't have to be completely ripe. He can, he can sell. But they were still green. The fruits are still green. He's not allowed to sell. Okay, so we have our own rules, ya ikhwan, when it comes to business. The subject of sale must be in the ownership of the seller at the time of sale. And this is a big issue. This is a red flag. You need to pay attention to it. This is a warning here. If you're doing murabaha and the FI doesn't own the house or doesn't own the car, they're not allowed to sell it to you. They're not allowed to make a sale agreement with you. The sale agreement is not valid, and we have proofs. I'll share the proof with you today. So this is a red flag in the market. Number three, the, the subject of sale must be in the physical or constructive possession of the seller when he sells it to the customer. This is another uh, red flag, but, but this is more important. Number two is more important than this one because usually in the housing market, this is not an issue. The house exists and you have access to it when you buy it, whether you buy it in a halal way or in, a, in an agreement that is not valid, you get access. Usually you get access to your house. Anyway, it's not a big issue, but in Islamic Sharia, the seller has to have the physical or constructive possession. What is the difference? Physical, he has it in his hand, full control, right? Constructive, he has control, uh, and it was the, 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 the risk has been transferred to him, to the, to the seller, right? For example, I'll give you an example. Someone, a businessman who ordered some merchandise from China, right? Now, if the Chinese company pays for the, the shipping company, pay the shipping company and tell them, you need to take this merchandise to Canada, to so-and-so. It is still, still under their liability. So there was no transfer of risk because the Chinese company here is in charge of transporting these commodities to Canada, to their Canadian customer. Here, the Canadian customer is not responsible. If, if there is some damage that happens, he's not responsible for this damage and he's not allowed to sell this bidaa, this commodity. He's not allowed to sell it. But if he chooses his own shipping company and he pays them, and they are the one who take, they, now they will be acting as his agent. They go to China or they have an office in China. So they act as his agent. He pays them the fees, and now they are the one who will bring these commodities or this products to him, merchandise to him, it came actually the fact that his, this shipping company, which is acting as an agent 
on behalf of the Canadian uh, customer, or I would say, methane businessman, uh, the fact that this company, shaping company, received uh, these products or these commodities, then he's allowed to sell because they are under his, what? Liability. If something happens to them, he's responsible. And, and he is allowed in this case to, to, you know, to sell. Constructive, for example, you make a transaction with the bank instead of giving you, buying American with Canadian, instead of giving you the American in your hand, they transfer American money into your, into your account. You didn't receive the money in your hand, so this is not physical possession. Right? It's called constructive possession because it's your account and you have access. You are supposed to have access to your account. If the money is immediately, has been immediately transferred to your account and you have immediate access to it, then you're fine. It is in your, in your possession, even if it is not in your, in your hand. Now, so this is the difference between physical and constructive, Allah Ta'ala. The sale must be instant and absolute, yani a sale that is attributed to a future date. Like, uh, we'll conclude the sale on January 1st, 2023. And then both of you believe that the sale is included, but it will take effect on January 2023. This is not permissible. What is permissible is to promise. On January 2023, I will buy this car from you. They said, okay, that's fine. I can wait for you. You can promise. You can agree on the price if you want. As long as you understand that this is a promise and nothing is binding. There is no binding a promise between you know, both of you. If it, if it is binding from both sides, then it's equivalent to a sale in the, uh, from a sharia, uh, from an Islamic perspective. The price has to be well defined. If the price is un uncertain, the sale is not, is not valid. And yeah, this is a big, another big issue, another red flag. Because here in Murabaha, if we say the price has to be fixed, then refinancing is not permissible. Refinancing is not permissible. By the way, as I said, I'm not going to mention companies, but I saw the website of a company that says we deal with Murabaha. And we're trying to be fully transparent, but allowing refinancing every five years. So I don't understand. I don't understand this. But this is something that you need to pay attention to. The price has to be fixed. They cannot change the price. There's no refinancing after five years or 10 years. And it is a risk for them. We'll, we'll, we'll mention, you know, some types of, of risks for, for them, for the companies, and for, for the clients, too. Now, this murabah in modern times is usually combined, as I said, with a sale with a deferred payment plan. It's called bay' mu'ajjal. And that's why people like it, because they don't have money. They don't have cash to pay for the, for the house, right? They don't have cash. So that's why they need this, this facility here. And it is valid with the following conditions. Due date of payments are fixed. And this is found with most companies. I mean, it's easy for them. There is no, they don't have an issue with that. They give you a plan from day one. They give you a payment plan, how much you pay as a deposit. And then they give you a payment plan for like 15 years, 20 years, 10 years. This is not an issue. The deferred price may be more than the cash price. And I, I explained that this is halal. This is halal and there is nothing wrong with it. Minority, small number of scholars who said, no, this is not permissible. But the overwhelming majority, overwhelming majority of Muslim scholars believe that this bay' al-taqsid, bay' mu'ajjal, ma'a ziyada fi thaman, you know, with an increase in the price, it is, is permissible. So we have no issue with that. And we're following the, the majority of Muslim scholars who believe it's halal. Yes? Is that predetermined? Predetermined. And it has to be agreed upon. It has to be agreed the upon. Now, the the of course, it has to be registered, well registered in the, in the contract from day one. Yes. If it is not fixed or it is vague, yani they don't agree on it, the contract is not valid. So does this take into account net present value of money as we move forward? Is that 
It is, it is. So uh, Islam allows for time value of money in two cases, Bay al Mu'ajjal and Bay al Salam, two cases, right? It's not, yani it's not affordable. Yeah, it means something that you, you, you believe it's, a, it's an act of, it's an act of dhulm, yeah. uh, injustice. Yeah. Islamically is not. Islamically is not. Yani I'll, I'll tell you something. There is a, a misconception within our Muslim communities. I don't know why, what is the source of this misconception. That Prophet cannot exceed, cannot exceed 10%. I don't know what is the background of this uh, misconception. There is no limit for profit. There is no limit for profit as long as. Huh? As long as you agree. You agree and you do business in a halal way. You, you don't violate the rules of Sharia. You see what I'm saying here? But there is no limit for profit as long as you're not cheating the person, you're not giving the wrong information, you're not dealing with riba. You're not uh, dealing with uncertainty, gharar. You, know, you see what I'm saying here? There is a Sahabi who bought, yes. So what is an example of a good Muslim example? We'll talk about it today. <laughs> we'll talk about it today, inshallah. So we'll go through. This halaqa is dedicated for murabaha. So <laughs> Yeah, a Sahabi who bought, uh, Rasulullah gave him one dinar. He said, go and buy a sheep for me. He went, and mashallah, this Sahabi was, uh, was a good businessman, so he got two sheep instead of one, for one dinar. So each one was half a dinar. Dinar was, at that time, was a golden dinar. You know, the weight of one dinar is 4.25 grams of gold. Yeah, uh, mashallah, the currency was very, was very expensive. Huh? <laughs> so, so he bought two sheep. And by the way, يعني, it's, it's very close. The price of gold nowadays, 4.25, is very close to the price of sheep nowadays in Canada. يعني, if you compare, subhanAllah, it's still almost the same. Anyway, that's a different story. But he bought two sheep, right? And then when he was going back, Taking the two sheep to Rasulullah Sallallahu he met a, a, another person. And he said, uh, can, you buy, can you sell one of them to me? The other person. And he told him, yes, okay, I'll sell one to you. Because Rasulullah Sallallahu asked him to buy one. And he volunteered and he bought two. Right? So he said he felt that he's, he, he has the freedom to sell the second one. So he sold the second one for one dinar. So how much is this profit here? Hundred percent? Yeah. So he went to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was amazed. He said, how, how did you do it? So he got, he said, here is your dinar and here is a sheep. <laughs> and he said, how did you do it? And he explained to him what happened. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua for him. That Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will bless his business transactions. He moved after the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu to the city of Al-Kufa in Iraq. He said, I used to go to the marketplace in the morning. Before Dhuhr, he said, before going back to my family, I would make sometimes in one transaction 40,000. I don't know, 40,000 dinars, that's, that's a fortune. For, or 40,000 dirham, because dirham was made of silver, that's a different story here. But he said 40,000. So, yani, mashallah, this man became a, a wealthy. So anyway, uh, due date of payments are fixed. The deferred price may be more than the cash price. After the sale is concluded, the price cannot be decreased in case of earlier payment. Okay, this is a minor issue here. Why? Because there are so ulama, they said, no, it's okay if we decrease the price in case of earlier payment. But most of the companies these days, they don't allow for this. But if they don't allow, that's okay. Still, is a minor issue. It's not a big issue. Why? Because the majority of Muslim scholars believe that it cannot decrease in case of earlier payment based on agreement. They cannot يعني, make an agreement from day one that, hey, if you pay me earlier, I will give you a discount. 
So majority of Muslim scholars believe that this is not permissible. Some of them, they said it is permissible. I'm inclined, inclined towards this opinion. But either way, it's not a, it's not a big issue. Wallahu ta'ala. But most of the companies don't allow for this. And here, and this is a big problem here. It cannot be increased in case of a default. It cannot be increasing. Why? Because it's riba. So now how Muslim companies are doing business and how Islamic banks will do business, how, how are Muslim customers pressurized? We need to pressure uh, and put some pressure on them to pay on time. Otherwise, we cannot do business like the other people. So there are different solutions. Some, some banks, Islamic banks and uh, financial institutions, they said if you, delay, if you default on your payment, will charge you like a capped fee, $50, $100, just to cover the expenses. This is one idea. The other idea that is more acceptable nowadays, uh, Muslim scholars have encouraged Islamic banks and, and uh, uh, housing companies and Islamic uh, financial institutions to create a charitable department. So if someone defaults on his payment, they charge him a penalty, and they take this penalty and, put, and they put it in this charitable department so that the institution itself does not benefit from this increase. It goes to charity, and it's given to the poor and the needy. So this is not a major issue. Yani if you have this in the agreement, I don't think this should stop you from signing the agreement. You see what I'm saying? But as, as a basic principle, it's called fil fiqh shart ribawi. Yani it is a ribawi stipulation. But what is the difference between this stipulation and between paying riba, the actual payment of riba? Like when you take a loan through a credit card, money. They charge you interest right away. You're paying interest. But if you use the credit card to, to buy some food, right? They don't charge you interest right away. They give you a grace period, right? One month you'll have to pay. So if you pay on time, you didn't pay interest. I'm not saying it's halal and you can use your credit card all the time to buy milk and, and bread. I'm not saying that. If you have a credit card, use it only when there is a pressing need, right? This is the ruling. Wallahu ta'ala alam. So you don't have, you don't, and you stay away. You try to protect yourself from riba as much as you can. Right? But the difference is between this condition or this stipulation and between paying riba, there is a big difference. When you pay riba, that's a, that's a sin, right? But when you have a condition, if you avoid this condition, you avoid this problem, at the end you will not pay riba. So the ulama here in North America, they said these late fee uh, penalties, you know, are found in many contracts. Many contracts that we, that we sign. So they said, you know, if they are there in the contract, you, can, you are allowed as a Muslim to sign this contract, and you try your best to avoid riba, not to default. Because when you sign this contract that has this condition, you're not paying riba. It's just a term there that is not sharia compliant. Be not paying really if you try to try your best not to default. You try your best to pay on time. Are you able to see the difference? Yeah. Huh? So you are not able to see the difference? Yeah. Naam? It's a payment in full situation. In what, yeah, when you default. Right. When you don't pay on time. Yeah. So but we have debits, yeah, Sheikh. We have debits and the visa debits and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we have prepaid credit cards nowadays. I'm not saying yani, they are perfect, but we have these prepaid credit cards and there are solutions, yani. No, and, and not, not, it's not an argument. It's, it's basically a. But this is not our subject today. We need yeah. to we need to use time wisely. What is the time? 9.05, we still have some time. <laughs> Can you explain the difference between the fee and the interest? So when you're saying it's... 
So the fees, if you default on a credit sale and you end up paying the fees, it is a form of interest. What I'm saying is if you sign this contract, you need it. Like let's say utilities, uh, using a phone, buying a phone from a company, you have a contract with these companies. This condition is always there. You see what I'm saying? No, no. If you default, you'll pay it. Whether it's not one time fee. Like if you default in the month of June, you pay some fees. If you default in the month of, on the month of September, you'll pay some fees. It's not one time. Whenever you default, you miss your obligation, then you pay some fees. That's a form of riba. But what I'm saying is signing a contract here. And you try your best not to default. You try your best to pay on time. There shouldn't be a big problem when you need that contract. I'll, 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 I'll explain to you something. You know, do you know the difference between necessity, darura, and haja, need? So the ulama are saying in North America, if you need this contract, you need to sign it. Because you're not paying the interest. But you are signing a contract that includes a stipulation that is not fully Sharia compliant, but you can do nothing about it. Because this is how business works in, in this country. But paying riba is a major sin. And it is halal only at times of darura, necessity. And you, you know the necessity. I'll give you an example. Eating khanzir. When do you eat khanzir? Pork. Huh? Yeah, when do you drink alcohol? At the time of the rura. You don't have another alternative, halal alternative. When it comes to housing, when you don't have a shelter, this is the rura. When you don't have a shelter, you are in the street, this is the rura. But owning, become, becoming an owner of a house is not the rura, is haja, is a need. Are you able to distinguish between the two? Huh? So there is a big difference. These are levels of needs in Islam, darura, need, and uh, luxurious, you know, luxuries, uh, kamaliyat. Which one? Yeah, the, that's right, but, uh, but people, yani the ulama who live in North America, and they, they know that this condition is Stipulation is there. This term is there in many contracts. No, I understand, but in the, in the, in the contract is darur, but the house is not. So it's not that's what I'm doing. But it is haja. They said they are not talking about darur. They said if there is haja, there is a difference between paying interest, paying interest, and between signing a contract that includes this stipulation. That if you try to protect yourself from defaulting, you don't default. You don't pay interest. There is a big difference between the two. In the first case, you will be really paying. There is an actual payment of, of interest. And it is halal only at times of darura. In the second case, there is no actual payment of interest. But there is a possibility. So here there is a, a payment of riba, and here there is a possibility. And that possibility uh, it, is, it becomes, ha yes, but it becomes halal at times of need, haja. Here, the actual payment, yes, haja, need. And we need cars, we need, we need to sign this contract, we need to, and I'm? I thought, I thought, the, 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 yeah, what I'm saying, there are different muharramat, different levels of muharramat. Paying its interest in itself is a major sin. Signing a contract that includes a term that you're not happy with, but you try your best, inshallah, to protect yourself and not to fall into this trap. This, is, this becomes halal at the time of haja, and it is not a major sin. It's not like paying riba. Are you able to see the difference? Huh? Okay. Is it clear for everyone? Yes. Housing? Housing of what? Yeah, yeah and to own a house is a need. It's not a darura, but it is, it is a darura necessity to have a shelter. Are you able to distinguish between having a shelter and owning a house? 
what I'm saying, Islamic companies came up with a solution. What is the solution? Charity. Uh, it, it makes you good, feel good, at least. Yani, they're not taking themselves, they're not taking something haram. If they, are, if they are sincere and they are not using this money themselves, they are not adding it to their account, they're putting it in a charitable account, then should, this should give you some peace of mind as a Muslim. What I'm trying to say, that if you find this in a contract, this is not a major issue. Is that clear, Ikhwan? So now, to secure his payments, the seller is allowed to ask for a mortgage or a lien as a security after the ownership of the property is transferred to the buyer. Mortgage in itself is not haram. In itself is not haram in Islam. We have the concept of mortgage in Islam, al rahn What is haram with conventional mortgages? Interest. So interest is haram. Mortgage itself is not haram. So there is halal mortgage. Lean, to place a lien as a security is permissible, completely permissible. After the property is, or the ownership of the property is transferred to the buyer. Now, it is not permissible to deprive the buyer the ownership of the property or the commodity. The brother, you were asking about dhulm. This is a big issue here in Alberta these days. As I said, I'm not going to mention names of companies, but this is a big issue. The final stage, which is transfer of ownership, does not exist. It is delayed until stipulated in contracts. We'll talk about it. I'll, I'll, I'll give you, actually, I will mention some decisions made by major Islamic fiqh councils that this is not permissible. It is not permissible for them to keep the ownership of the property until the client fully pays the whole price. And this might happen, might take a place within a period of 15 years or 20 years. So just to clarify, yes. ownership is transferred, but there's still a mortgage on it. Making no, there is no transfer of ownership. Uh, I'll, we'll come to that, inshallah, but let's, let's talk about, this is what is, yani, I'm talking about uh, the Islamic requirement. We'll come to the companies, as I said, without mentioning names, but we'll come to the industry. What is happening? I was focused on the process. Naam? I was focused on the process in terms of a buy-sell deal based on deferred payments. That's what we're talking so, about. so Islamically, all ulama agree that it is not permissible to deprive the buyer because it is a basic effect of any sale contract. This is one of the most important effects or consequences or, or result of any contract. Let me clarify to make sure I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So I buy a house from you. Yeah. And we agree to a price and yeah. payment. Yeah. The moment we conclude the sale, right. I own the house and you own the price. This is an automatic result of any contract. So, so the number how do you own a house? We'll talk about it here. How, yani there is a sale, an agreement of sale that is signed between two lawyers. The lawyers will be representing, two lawyers representing the seller and the buyer. And then after that, you need to register the land title. Without registering the land title, you are not an owner in Canada. We'll talk about, that's a bigger issue here nowadays. And is it also an issue overseas? Overseas. Like in, it, in some cultures, it's a different story. We'll, we'll go, come to that. Actually, that's the source of confusion. Source of confusion is that, that issue. But that, I'm talking about Alberta, not uh, Ontario. There are some other uh, companies in Ontario that are offering murabaha. I'm not sure if they have this problem. But here I'm talking about the new companies that were established. Recently in Edmonton, there are three or four of them. This is a big issue. But we'll, we'll come to that, inshallah. And I'll tell you why they don't transfer. They don't allow the transfer of the land title. So, murabaha financing. Uh, we said that the cost of the sold commodity is known. The profit or markup is well-defined. 
All expenses incurred by the seller in acquiring the commodity, like legal fees, he is allowed to include them in the cost price. But he's not allowed to include methanin. For example, the rental fees for his office in that month, for example, has nothing to do with, with the intended transaction. We're talking about one specific transaction, selling the house to Muhammad, right? Any cost that is related to this transaction, the seller is allowed to include it in the final cost. So he would buy the house 350 from, uh, from Mr. X, right? But it cost him some extra. He had to pay some extra fees here and there. And the final cost was 360. He's allowed Islamically to add this 10,000. And to tell the customer that the final cost was 360 and my profit will be 140 and therefore the final price will be 500, half a million. Yes. Ujur? No, no, no. Ujur al amilin the salaries, uh, the, the, the rental fees of his office, are not, he's not allowed to, to include them. He's allowed to include any extra, you know, cost, any extra money that he paid for the sake of executing this specific transaction between him, FI, financial institution, and the buyer or the home buyer, Muhammad or Ali or Abdul Qadir or whomever is buying the house. But he's not allowed to add other extra fees that are usually taking, uh, yani, uh, yani paid by his company on a regular basis to maintain his business. You see the difference? Okay. Yeah, that's right. It has to be known. Otherwise, it cannot call it murabaha. You see what I'm saying? So, Sheikh Hassan. Yes. And it's close to the, the interest rate in the, in the markets. Yeah, and it's not a problem. It's not an issue. Yeah. It's not an issue. So that's not an issue. Yeah, if they are following, uh, yeah, usually it is more. Murabah it's more. They have to make money. So it's, it's not the same. It's more expensive. Yani if the interest rate in the market is 2%, 3%, their profit will be around 5%, 6%. Because they need to make money. Yeah, they have to make money. I mean, this is how they make money. And it is expensive for Muslim customers. It is expensive. But we take this into consideration. يعني, you know, it, it becomes a personal decision. Do you want to pay this extra money? With some issues that are there. You know what I mean? If This is not the only problem. This is not the only issue. But we'll talk about some other issues. Because there, is, uh, there are different types of risk. There are financial risks, and this is a financial risk. And there are sharia risks. And all, most of the Muslims who don't want to buy a house through a conventional mortgage are running away from the sharia risk. They want to do it in a halal way. They, want, they don't want to take this risk and face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the burden of riba on the day of judgment. That is their intention. You see what I'm saying here? So they're running away from haram. But what are the other alternatives? Are they pure? Are they perfect? Are they good? Now, are they ch cheap or expensive? That's a different story. If they are purely halal and expensive, then it becomes a, a personal, personal decision. I have no say. I mean, it's your. As an imam, I have no say regarding this. It's your personal decision. If you want to pay some extra money to get something halal, that's your decision. You see what I'm saying here?
Uh, you can Islamically, you can, but uh, but when it, in the market, maybe you can't. If the if the t the ownership is transferred, usually the the FI will place a lien on the on the property. They need to secure their contribution, so they will place a lien. They will not allow you to sell it without their permission. So yeah, at the end, you have to make an arrangement with them. But you can sell it, and Islamically, if there is a profit, it's yours. Because you become the owner after the sale is concluded. Again, this is not a loan, it's a sale. And you are supposed to be the owner of the house after you conclude the sale. So if you make a profit, if the prices go up, it, then it's your money. You can put it in your pocket. Yeah, yeah. No, it's still haram. <laughs> One percent is haram. Zero point five percent is haram. Two percent is haram. Three percent is haram. It has to be zero interest. It has to be zero. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think we talked about all these issues. I'm just uh, being repetitive here. Yeah, we talked about these issues. Stages of Murabaha, so it's just to have a better understanding. So we'll talk about stages of Murabaha, and then we we'll talk about the red flags, and then we we'll talk about some issues that, are, uh, that we are facing يعني, in, this, uh, in this market. The client applies for Murabaha approval to the FI. This application includes a promise to buy from the FI, a promise. The application is approved. By the FI, the approval includes a promise to sell. Here, there is a red flag. Why? Because the, the, the promise from both parties cannot be binding. If it is a binding commitment, then it is equivalent to a legal sale in the Islamic Sharia. But if it is binding from one side, that's okay, that's fine. And then the other side has the right to cancel the deal or not to do it, not to proceed further with the transaction, that's okay, that's fine. Yes? What if, if there was a charge for passing the is that okay? It's okay, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, this is the, the decision of uh, Majma' al Fiqh al Islami, uh, the Muslim Fiqh Council. If, uh, for uh, one party, for let's say the FI started the process of buying the house and they spent some money, and then the client had no obligation, it's just a promise, it was a mere promise. And then he changed his mind. So what will happen is they have the right to charge him the fees or the cost of their whatever, whatever is there. They spent some couple of thousands, method and to... And to put that many up front would be okay? Like uh, to make it a condition is okay. To make it, to stipulate this condition, it's okay that if we, you don't proceed with, with a transaction and we have some charges, we will charge you these fees. This is permissible, as I said. It's not something agreed upon, but again, it's not it's a minor issue. It's not a major issue. It's not a red flag. <laughs> but the problem is, if it is binding, binding from both sides, then it's haram. Because the, he cannot sell it to him. He doesn't own it. The financial institution here, at this stage, doesn't own the property. You cannot sell something you don't own. The client chooses the house which they want to buy from the FI. The FI secures the funds and purchases the house. The ownership of the house is under the FI. Here there is a minor issue, very tricky. Here, most, like, most of the Islamic, uh, I would say, fiqh councils allow the seller to buy, uh, to sell the property to the home buyer or to the buyer, if the, if, if the commodity is something different, within five minutes, 10 minutes, after they get the ownership, after they buy it, and it comes into enter, under their risk and their liability and their ownership, they can sell it right away. But if it is, we're talking about homes here in Canada, the, the, the FI might sign a contract with the lawyer it's a sale of agreement, right? It's an agreement of sale, right? And then 
But to become a full owner here in Canada, you have to register the title. But they are not interested in that. Because they are, they are allowed Islamically to sell it right away to the customer within a couple of hours, within one day. And to register the title before COVID, people needed, they used to need like two weeks, three weeks to register the title. Now, after COVID, they need two months or three months, unless, unless it changed. Allahu alam. But this is the, the feedback that I received recently. So two months and three months, usually these companies will not wait for three months. And there is no point for them to... Why I'm saying it's a minor issue, because might people, some people might think that this, is, this uh, goes against the, 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 you know, the principle of uh, the Islamic principle that says that the owner or the seller has to own the property before they sell it. You see what I'm saying here? We have a problem at the end when these companies are not transferring the, the title for what? Allowing the, 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 the customer to, to get the title for the period of 15 years or 20 years. The conclusion of this research that this is not permissible. In Canada, it's not permissible because there is no ownership. But here we are allowing the FI to sell it within one hour or two hours, resell it to the customer even before they receive the title. What's the difference? The difference is there is no restriction from the bank. If they buy it from the bank, the bank doesn't put any restriction. They can register, start the process of registering the title, right? The, the, the bank will place a lien. The bank doesn't have intention, for example, if they buy it from the bank, to keep the ownership of the house. There is no ownership. He doesn't, the bank doesn't own the house. The, the house was owned by Mr. X or Mr. Y. The bank is financing the deal. But the bank is interested in securing uh, the, the fund, the financing, the amount of money that he's paying here. So anyway, there are no restrictions for the FI. No one is telling them no. There is no stipulation. When it comes to Muslim brothers, Muslim home buyers, in the contracts that we have recently, there is a restriction that you cannot, there will be no transfer of title until the price is fully paid and this will take place, as I said, within 15 years or, or 20 years. So here, even in Islam, we have gharar fahish, excessive gharar, and we have a low level of gharar uncertainty. Here, within one month, two months, three months, is a low level of uncertainty. 15 years, 20 years is a huge risk. And it's an excessive level of gharar, of uncertainty. We'll talk about it here. But uh, I just want you, I, want, I wanted to explain this. So at the end, you don't tell me how come you allowed the FI to sell it here without registering the, uh, having the land title. And we don't allow it in the second case at the end because there is an excessive level of gharar, 15 years, 20 years. Anything could happen within 15 years or 20. A huge financial risk. And there is a sharia risk. If the, if the buyer is not an owner, the contract is not valid from an Islamic perspective. Yes, brother. Someone raise his hand. Sorry, yeah. from, uh, based on uh, number four, how important is it to see how the connection of the two is secured in the front? What if they are securing the front in the connection? Okay, that's another minor issue here. That, Jazakallah khair. There are people, some people, some Muslims, if the, if the FI, Mathanan, is buying the house, buys the house from the bank and then they resell it to them. They believe that this is not halal. It is halal as long as you don't tell them, go and buy the house from the bank for me. If you tell them, go to the bank and get a mortgage and then resell the house to me, then this is haram. But if you apply to them, and this is what happened to a Muslim brother in Calgary. He applied, his application was approved, just recently, in the last six months, seven months, his, uh, his, his application was approved. On the time, on the day of closing the deal, he found the name of a bank on the title, a mortgage charge. He didn't know about it. 
So on that day, he found out that the FI bought the house from the bank. This Muslim brother is free from any responsibility here. He didn't know, and he didn't tell them. So in this case, it's halal. But the hurma, the problem is in, 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 in the last stage, which is transfer of ownership. So this is a minor issue. Some people don't feel good about it, some Muslims. If they know that the FI is buying the property from a bank, as long as they don't do it with your approval, you're not approving, you're not telling them, go and do it, then it's their business. What is the proof? They said the ulama, they said Rasulullah used to make business with the Yahud in the city of Medina. And they were heavily involved in riba. And he used to accept their invitation. There was a Yahudi lady who invited him. Some other Jewish people who invited him, he used to accept their invitation and eat their food, and he used to buy and sell, do business with them. So the Islamic Sharia is saying, you're buying and selling with someone, you have nothing to do with his own transactions. Are you trying to, uh, is that clear, Yahweh? Yeah. You have nothing to do with their transaction. You should care about your transaction with them. Yeah, and usually, usually uh, Islamic uh, companies are not supposed to do that. I'm not supposed. I'm not saying they are not. <laughs> you, know, you see what I'm saying? They are not supposed to go and secure the funds from conventional banks. And actually, this will not solve our problems if they do it this way. It will not solve. It will be, many ulama, they said this should be a temporary solution. But until now, it's used and this is the only option that we have. But the problem is not that. If it was a purely halal option, then go ahead and do it. You have nothing to do with the industry or, you know, uh, <laughs> the macro management of the economy. Care about yourself as an individual. <laughs> you know, you need a house for your family. As long as it's halal, the transaction is halal, the contract is halal. You know what I mean? The problem is, you as a Muslim, you come to this market, you pay some extra money because you're running away from the bank, but you end up having some issues with the contract itself. You see what I'm saying here? And this is what I want to explain to you. And inshallah, if we can put some pressure on these companies, we can um, increase the awareness about this, about this business. Maybe, maybe these companies will try, inshallah, for, you know, they will try they will try to do, to do something good for, for the community. Uh, I, I have to assume, you know, I'll, I'll tell you something. There are some brothers who tell me, this company got this certification from these scholars from Egypt, scholars from South Africa, scholars from Malaysia. And I, I can't say anything. I, some of them, I don't know them. I don't know their names. I don't know them. I don't know their, their knowledge. So I cannot discuss people and discuss, you know, you know what other people. The, I have, I have here. There is a clear policy in our Sharia, and there is a clear, mashallah, way how to do it in a halal way. We look at what is available in the market. If it is compliant, fully compliant with the Sharia, we go ahead and do it. If there are issues that we need to talk about them, and and be aware of them. And inshallah, hopefully, there will, become, there will come a group of people who will do it in, a, in the right way. Bidnillahi ta'ala. So uh, let, let, me, let me move forward, inshallah, and then at the end. Maybe we'll leave the question till the end. I think this is a better decision now. If, we, if you want me to finish on time. Five, both have I and the client make an agreement of sale, which include a monthly payment plan and the payment of deposit. Okay, why this, there is a red flag here? Okay, yes, because the property, I, we talked about it before. The price of the property is, there is no financing, refinancing. So it's fixed, and the payment plan is clear, and you know how much you're paying. Possession and ownership of whom are transferred to the client. Usually the possession, yes. But ownership, not in many companies, not all of them, as I said. When I say ownership is not transferred, usually I'm talking about companies here in Alberta. Right? I'm not sure about the other companies in Ontario. 
so what is the alternative? How do, how do they try to secure, to give some security to the client? They came up with an idea, it's called, it's a ca caveat. So it is registered as buyer's or purchaser's interest, buyer's interest caveat on the title. This is how it is registered. Buyer's interest caveat. Doesn't say anything else. As I talked to some lawyers, they told me caveats are different. Uh, it depends on what is written. I, I looked at two contracts. This is what is written, buyer's interest caveat. I talked to lawyers, I talked to real estate agents. They told me caveat is just a legal notice. And you can check it yourself on Google. It's a legal notice. It's a legal notice. If there is a judgment, if there is a case, then the judge will take a notice that you have, you have interest. It's not like a lien. It's not like a lien. It doesn't have the power of a lien. So this Muslim brother who bought the house, he found the mortgage charge of a bank on the title. And the bank has a lien, has a mortgage cha charge. The brother, the Muslim brother who bought the house, he has this buyer's interest caveat. There is a big difference between the two. And I talked to uh, the, one of the owners of these companies, uh, as I said, I'm not going to mention names. I have to protect their, uh, it's their, it's not ethically, it's not ethical to talk to them, have a private conversation with them, and then I share it with other people. Uh, but uh, we talk about ideas. I, I had a conversation with the, one of the owners of these companies, and I asked him this question. In case you go into bankruptcy, what will happen to the Muslim customer? He has a, cave, a caveat, right? This Muslim customer has a caveat, which is just a legal notice. And the bank has a lien, a mortgage charge. And it's obvious that the bank will have the upper hand. This is what many lawyers have confirmed to me, that if this happens, bankruptcy is a different story anyway, but if this happens, the bank has to satisfy, satisfy, uh, satisfy it's, it's uh, you know, uh, needs, yeah, he, the, the bank paid money. The bank has to get his money back, its money back. And the Muslim customer has no right. This ha caveat has no power to, cha to challenge the lien or the mortgage charge. And he told me, I cannot answer this question. My lawyers have to need to answer this question. And he's the founder of the company. <laughs> so, now I, I underlined this, I underlined this because it says to secure the rights of the client. Are they secure? I don't think so. They're not. They're not. It's like in no, it, it's not, they're not secure. <laughs> now some people, they said caveat money is very, amount is very protected if there is nothing against it. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some idea about lien, lien here. I have some, it's very, uh, just give me a second here. I, I'm sure you know, most of you are familiar with the power of the lien in this, in this society, right? It says a lien is a claim or a legal right against assets that are typically used as a collateral to satisfy a debt. A creditor, here the bank, or a legal judgment could establish a lien. A lien serves to guarantee an underlying obligation, such as the, pay, the repayment of a loan. If the underlying obligation is not satisfied, the creditor may be able to seize the asset. Look at the power of the lien. The, the seize the, the asset, and where is it? That is the subject of the lien. There are many types of liens that are used to secure assets. And he said the lien is a claim or legal right. It's a legal right. You cannot, and you know what one of the lawyers told me? This caveat can be easily removed from the title. This is the feedback of one of the lawyer, one of the lawyers. He's not a Muslim lawyer, but he knows about this, uh, these issues. Anyway, the FI will ple place a lien on the property to secure their rights. This is halal. This is halal if we do it in the right way. After the ownership is transferred to the, to the customer, the FI has the right to place a lien. 
And this is what the conventional banks are doing. The title is transferred to the client, the home buyer, and the banks will place a lien. طيب. Now there is a text after the murabaha payments. This is if it is done in the right way. <laughs> That's why we have this statement here. <laughs> after the murabaha payments are completed, the mortgage charge is removed. This is the right process. And the client is in possession of a clear title, Alf Mabrook. We wish that will happen one day, inshallah. Huh? Yeah. So everything in the black is, uh, is halal. <laughs> everything in red, <laughs> you have to be careful about it. Lean or rahn? Rahn, yeah. Mortgage is rahn too. So now pay attention to this. This is a conclusion of this presentation. The red flags. Subject of sale must be in the ownership of the seller at the time of sale. Okay? This is the proof. We have proof for everything. Hakim ibn Hizam asked the Prophet a man comes to me and wants to sell, wants me to sell him something which is not in my possession. So Rasulullah said, do not sell what is not with you. He did not talk about the transaction itself, like مثلاً, buying something and resell it to someone else. He didn't tell him anything about it, which is halal, which means it's halal. He approved it. If it was haram, he would say something against it, right? But he told him, do not sell what is not in you, with you, which means if you buy it, you want to resell it back to him, that's okay, that's halal. But do not sell it before you own it, before it is with you. See what I'm saying? And this is a sahih, authentic hadith, famous hadith, yes. That's a different story. It could be done through Salem, because Salem is, uh, is an exception. But Salem has his own condition. But it's a different story. Let's focus on Murabaha tonight. <laughs> Second red, f red flag, number two. Subject of sale must be in the physical constructive possession of the seller before it is sold to the client. So Rasulullah has forbidden profit arising from something which is not in one's charge or liability. The hadith is Hassan. And you cannot profit from something that is not under your liability, under your risk, right? You have to have liability, you have to have some risk to profit from, you know, a product or a commodity or... And there are some other proofs for this. The price of a murabah has to be fixed until the end of the payment plan. Why? Because Rasulullah forbade any transaction which involves uncertainty. If the price is not fixed, there is uncertainty. If it is fixed for three years or five years, and then, you know, the terms are negotiated after five years, or the, the rate is increased after five years, then there is uncertainty. You, you don't know how much. People were paying 2% just recently, one month ago, right? Now, Interest rate has been increased to 5%, maybe 5 something, right? It's a huge, actually, things are, getting, uh, are going to get ugly in the real estate market. Yeah, I, I read some, some articles that are uh, very difficult about what, uh, what will happen within the next two years, three years. Wallahu alam, you know, people are predicting. But they said homeowners might be buying some, uh, paying some extra 30% or 40%. I don't understand the increase here, but these are the predictions of uh, some people who are involved in this uh, industry. It is not permissible to prevent the home buyer from his right of ownership. Why? Because this is the most important effect of uh, any sale contract. That the owner, the seller will own the price and the buyer will own the property. It's a simple, basic consequence and result of any contract. So the ulama, they said, if there is any condition that goes against this simple effect, then the, the majority of Muslim scholars, they said, the sale is not valid. Now, why some ulama approved this kind of agreement? They're saying it was approved by IOFI. What is IOFI? Accounting and Auditing Organization for Islamic Financial Institutions. 
established, established in 1991, based in Bahrain, known for its Sharia standard. This is their website, Sharia standard. If you go to this link, you'll find their standards. Maybe around 1,200 pages in both languages. Both languages, Arabic and English, right? And Murabaha is number eight. Murabaha is number eight. Ayufi, number eight, Murabaha, page 195. I'm sharing this, why? Because we have a problem in, the, in, the, in this industry. What is the problem? Even some mashayikh are contributing into that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and forgive them. We say, they say all the time, okay, it was approved by Ayufi. So we're treating Ayufi like a, like a Quran now. The standard of Ayufi like Quran. But they are, they are a group of Muslim scholars. We respect them and we love them and we assume that they were doing things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help the community and help Islamic financial institutions, right? We have no right to assume otherwise. But they are mushtahidun, they are bashar. And they come up with ishtihadat, with some standards, some articles, some stipulations. This is what created problems in Alberta here. This article 4 5. But to be fair with these scholars, Ayufi scholars, this is what they said. It is not permissible to stipulate that the ownership of the item will not be transferred to the customer until the full payment of the selling price. So they relieve themselves from any responsibility. Cannot blame them. But the brothers and sisters or who are methane, supporting this business without a transfer of ownership, they are saying, we're using this clause here. However, it is permissible to postpone the registration of the asset in the customer's name as a guarantee for the full payment of the selling price. They said, we're, we're, we're using this clause. So therefore, this eh? for 15 years. <laughs> 15 years, yes. 10, 15, 20 years, yeah. Which is excessive level of gharar. Because as I said, one brother, one lawyer told me, if bankruptcy happens, that's a different level. But then if bankruptcy happens, and these companies might face, actually, these new companies, new established companies might face bankruptcy. Why? Because the interest rate is going up. So their cost will go up. I don't know if they can maintain business. And I don't know what will happen if the, if the central bank will increase the interest in the future. Allah alam what will happen to the market, right? If they go into bankruptcy, there is a simple formula. If their assets are worth more than 10 million and their liabilities are worth 12 million, what will happen to the poor guy, the home buyer, the Muslim home buyer? He doesn't own the house. He doesn't own the house. The ownership of the house belongs to the FI. And the FI goes into bankruptcy. As I said, if their assets are 10 million, let's say, liabilities 12 million, what will happen to the house? It's gone. Out. Bye-bye. Or he has to negotiate another deal with the bank. Maybe. So here they, they are saying, and, and they are saying also that the customer, the institution may receive authority from the customer to sell the asset in case the customer delays payment of the selling price. Islamically, this is accepted in a regular mortgage agreement. It is accepted, but the problem, the client here, within these agreements that we have in Alberta has no authority. He has a caveat. He doesn't own the house. Now here, it is not permissible to. The reason I underline this, because I looked at two, two agreements, two contracts with two companies. Both of them, they says, they, they, they don't have choice. They have to include it. The title will not be transferred in the name of the client until the price is fully paid the price of the property. As I said, it will be fully paid after 15 years or 20 years. They don't have a choice. They have to include it in the contract 
even if they call it Islamic or Sharia compliant. Why? Because if they don't include it, what will happen? The customer will go to the office and register the, 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 the property. They cannot stop him. He got an, a sale, uh, an agreement of sale from, the, from his lawyer. And he is in possession of the property now. He lives in it. Now, if he doesn't have this stipulation in the contract, what will happen? Nothing will prevent him from going to the office and register the title, right? So they have to include it, but they're saying the ulama who approved مثلا, this agreement, they're saying it was approved by IOFI. But IOFI is saying it is not permissible to stipulate. You see what I'm saying here? But they are saying no, because we have this clause here. And I talked to a scholar who is familiar with, no, he lives in North America, and he's familiar with customary practices back home. He said, this, this organization is in Bahrain. So most of the Muslim scholars there involved are from most of them. Some of them are Pakistan, India, some other countries, but most of them are from the Middle East. So they are familiar with the culture there. And he told me, in Egypt, if you go to, uh, you sign a contract with a lawyer, a sale contract, you sign it. They said you become, you have all the rights of an owner. You have all your rights and, and your rights will be respected and you, uh, you, uh, you, you have full ownership of the property. Even though people like to delay the registration with the land title, uh, title's office because of some other reasons that are related to their own culture there. And he said, you are a full owner. Your ownership is recognized in this country. So he said, this organization is in the Middle East. And they looked at this customary practices. That's why they said, however, it is permissible to postpone. It's OK to postpone the registration. And they said, at the end, so after we, they said this, they said, in which case, when, when the customer gave authority to the FI, in which case the inst institution should do what? Issue a counter deed to the customer to establish the latter's right ownership to ownership. I, I did a research about counter deed here. I talked to some lawyers and some real estate agents. They told me we don't have counter deed in Canada. We don't have, it is not recognized in Canada, it is not recognized in the United States of America, and it is not in, recognized in the UK. Because if you Google counter deed, it is recognized in some other countries, in some other cultures, and it's called a secret, it's a secret legal document meant to destroy a public one. It's like another agreement under the table. This is why I understood from the definition of counter deed. They said in Canada, no, you can, it's illegal. So our ulama brothers who agreed, who approved this, they looked at this and said maybe the caveat in Canada, in Alberta will replace the counter deed. You see what I'm saying here? I am just assuming, يعني, assuming because they, they said it was approved by IOF. I looked at the articles and the, the standard of murabah, yes. One minute? La ilaha illallah. <laughs> okay. Okay, one minute. Okay, I'll tell you, I'll give you the feedback of a brother without mentioning his name. The brother who bought a house through this agreement, this is what he sent me. And he allowed me to share this with you without, of course, names. Uh, can we delay the prayer a little bit, uh, Ziad? Cool. He, he told me, the brother, these are the issues that he faced after he bought the house. He said these are the disadvantages. Number one, the inability, the inability to take advantage of first home buyers using RSP to finance the house. He's not able to do that because he's not a registered owner. Number two, we missed all opportunities of rebates and carbon emission reductions through government programs such as replacing windows. He said we don't have the right to apply for that. He said, <clears throat> number three, 
applying for permits, applying for permits and anything to do with the city, we cannot do that because he's not recognized as an owner. He said we have to go through the FI. So he, he mentioned this point. I'll give you another payment plan. And you see yourself if it is expensive or not. Real estate agent can help us with this. One brother was given an offer by one of these companies. The initial price, 450. The initial price. They will buy the house for 450. The profit, 328. The profit, 328. The total price will be 778. Down payment, 130,000. Uh, the total amount financed, 648. The term was 15 years, so he had the obligation to make a payment of 3,600 every month. <laughs> well, I am just, I'm just sh sharing this information with you. The problem is, Yahwan, the idea that I want to share with you and emphasize is that we are running away from haram, right? Running away from haram. And coming to this area of halal industry, right? I want something halal. Yeah. I want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I end up paying more money. It's okay if it is halal, right? But this is expensive. We have some real estate agents here. Uh, Do you think this is reasonable, brothers? The numbers that I mentioned. It is difficult, yeah. It is difficult, yeah. The problem is, the problem is, with this contract here, I'm talking about Alberta again. Because as I said, the, the issue of transferring ownership, I don't know about what's going on in Ontario. I'm talking about Alberta. It's an excessive level of gharar to wait for 15 years or 20 years for the title to be transferred in your name. It's a huge risk. So I come with this huge risk. The, 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 the contract is not valid from an Islamic perspective. Because I'm, I, I'm told you are not an owner, and you cannot be an owner. You're using the house, and paying for the property tax, for insurance, enjoying the house, but if something wrong happens, I'm out. So this is, a, this is our situation now, as I said. Hopefully, something will happen in the future. Yes? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as I said, something I need to say, there are some ulama in Edmonton who approved this. This is their ishtihad. They looked at this text and they tried to derive some guidance from this text. Even though this is not Quran, this is an IOF standard. But that is their ishtihad. Some of them are nice people, I have to say this. Some of them are very good people, but this is their ishtihad. Why are they doing this? I'm talking about the good people, the good ulama that we know. They have a strong desire to help the community. They're looking for a solution. They're trying to help the community. But the, our counter argument, we want something halal. We want peace of mind. I don't want to run away from the bank, conventional max, and go into an area where I, I don't have my peace of mind. I feel like worried and you know I'm taking a big risk for 15 years, well, that's not right. So this is the message that we send to our ulama, and we tell them, caveat is only a legal notice. It doesn't have the power of lien, as I said. Maybe some other companies, I heard about some other companies, they're not buying from the bank. They have their own financing. So the story could be different. There is no mortgage charge, could be different. By why they don't transfer the title, that's another issue because even these other companies who are dealing with it, not dealing with the banks, they have this problem. No, the title will not be transferred until the full price is paid. So that's the same issue here. You see the difference? The financing could be different. They're getting money from different sources. But this, this condition at the end is not Sharia compliant. To tell me you're not an owner for 15 years or 20 years. I think we need to stop here and uh, we, it's 10, 10 o'clock, so the iqama will be after five minutes.